great to to be here in the intimate room of life itself. Uh, um, so talking about what I've been doing since uh, last year when I haven't been around the hub much. Uh, so I don't want, don't start a climate uh, kind of organization or movement if you, if you want spare time. Uh, but happy, so happy to be here. Uh, so what is the Climate Majority Project? It's a UK-based organization that aims to support uh, the climate concern majority of opinions in responding in meaningful, relevant ways to ecological emergency. Um, another way of saying it, saying it is, so when we started off life itself, we said it was a, a, a support group for people who uh, realized that we needed a wiser world quickly. Uh, CMP's kind of a rallying point um, for people to understand that time's up. Okay, so basically what we mean is there's been for a very long time this idea of five to midnight. So uh, in the UK, it was a you know, particularly famous song uh, where they said it's five to midnight. Of course, that was like, I think 2011. Um, and we've been stuck at five to midnight for about 30 years in messaging. Uh, times up, we're basically in the middle of an ecological emergency. Um, we're going to have chaos. It's just a question of how much. Uh, 1.5 barrier was was crossed for the first time early this month. So surface temperatures on Earth were more than 1.5 degrees C above the historical average. I, I don't know if people saw earlier today, but there was a, something published, which essentially in Nature, uh, which says that the um, overturning currents in the Atlantic can collapse this century. Um, so which is not thought to be the case earlier, but uh, we've been perpetually ahead of schedule. Uh, weather is making that undeniable. It was formerly sort of an abstract thing. A large number of people are realizing with the heat waves that we've been having, with the ecological disasters, they've been feeling that uh, there's that climate change is real and they want to do something. Um, but traditional activism doesn't really serve them. So it's the both the radical tactics and the progressive culture of traditional activist spaces don't really absorb the, the energies and imaginations of the majority of the population. That's what the Climate Majority Project is about, is creating a, a visible uh, railing fry in a space for uh, people who want to act in a different way urgently with the urgency of Extinction Rebellion, um, but um, without the, the adherence to I'd say a progressive cultural tone or, or the particular tactical or theory of change uh, that's required there. So our theory of change, we'd like to say is it gets as simple as possible and no simpler. Why? Well, basically what we're talking about is starting a climate mobilization. It's just historic. There's going to be a historical need for something like a climate mobilization that's as, as serious as any other mobile, anything else that we connect the word mobilization with, like wartime at war efforts, uh, but which is started on a, a popular level. And people are already looking into this, right? Uh, and and the, the question is, how do we kind of get some coherence around it? So I like to say oftentimes, you know, and people here in this kind of room, I think will probably resonate with this example, because you might have heard it before when we say, gee, I want to do something about climate change or the type of thing that life itself does, people will say, well, oh, so you want to save the world. And there's this kind of uh, ironic tone to it, right? But if you said the same thing, I want to say, organize the world's information, uh, and people might say the same thing. But then if you say, I'm working for Google, uh, people say, oh, okay. People, you might get a different kind of response because it feels like you're part of a larger whole. Uh, that is maybe capable of accomplishing something like that. So what one needs to do is, is create a coherence, right? It's part of the, of getting people in action is, is getting coherence um, and creating a sense of shared endeavor. Uh, so our launch campaign, which just landed us in national news on Good Morning Britain, uh, really targeted that, that reality, right? That there is, we ran, um, audience research earlier this year, uh, if you take climate concerned British people and you say, you know, these not people who are 
intelligentsia, beauticians, paramedics who are concerned about the climate and you ask them, well, who speaks for you and which organizations do you recognize? The majority of them say nobody and I don't feel a speaking for by any, to anybody. Uh, and then you ask, well, what would you like to see? And they say, essentially, um, we'd like to see something that had the kind of urgency of extinction rebellion, but we feel it's like for people like us. Uh, and that's really uh, something that we're trying to provide. Also, it's something that metamodernism or the metamodern movement might be able to help with, right? Because part of what we're looking to do is create a kind of conversation uh, that can accommodate all sorts of viewpoints. And so I think part of the thing I'd like to talk, you know, to kind of invite people and like itself to think about uh, is how what's happening, what we're calling the metamodern space can help make that happen. How we can sort of transcend uh, and include uh, some of the progressive viewpoints uh, that may help to get this, the, the, the climate movement stuck. Like for example, on uh, say progressive movements where people are very horizontal, they talk about leadership. I can tell you, if you talk to average people, they wanna see leaders, uh, particularly they'd like to see, you know, some very influential uh, people who are part of this movement. It's like, well, it'd be great if I could see David Attenborough or government ministers or somebody like that as part of this movement. And another thing that, say, a progressive ideology isn't very good at is appealing to elites, like political parties do. Uh, because, you know, one of the things about elites is that they have high agency. So you're not going to actually, if you, if you want to deliver the truth to people and get a powerful response, people who have an enormous feeling that actually I'm, I solve almost impossible questions for a living are the ones who respond really well. Right. So if you sort of talk to a government minister and say, gee, you know, actually the statistics I, I cited earlier, you get a, you know, a different response. And that's actually the most, one of the most validated uh, facts in climate psychology is that people who have uh, high levels of agency in their profession respond very differently to negative messaging. You may have heard that people get uh, paralyzed by negative messaging. It depends on how great of a position you feel and to do something. Uh, and that's not to say those are the only people you want on board, is that normal people are smart and they like to see that type of person on board with them in order to feel like some larger effort is part of doing something, right? Or is worthwhile. So our launch campaign uh, helped to get together a group of people like that that span the political spectrum. So it's several Tory peers. So Lord Deben, who's outgoing head of the Climate Change Committee, Swampy, who's basically the, you know, the prototypical British activist, he's the most famous activist in all of Britain. Uh, Chris Packham, who's a television presenter, he's kind of like the young David Attenborough, all signed a letter uh, saying that it was time, climate action was for everybody. Uh, and that made the Times, Good Morning Britain, um, the Mail, uh, the Guardian, and uh, the Express, and also got Dale Vince to sign on board, uh, who's uh, the founder of Ecotricity, which is uh, Britain's largest uh, green energy company. Uh, so basically, you know, these group of, of hitters, as we might call them in the, in, in the US, uh, symbolize the, the breadth of uh, support there is across society for climate action. They're far outside. The usual sus, they, they don't look like the usual suspects, and that is a way of reaching out to what's called a silent majority, right? So, what basically you, you find in in climate action, um, which is what I sort of discussed earlier, is a silent majority, as as Richard Nixon talked about it. So, I don't know if you we know that term that Richard Nixon used, but it's basically Richard Nixon gave a speech to the silent majority, which were People who uh, basically disliked Vietnam War protesters' tactics, uh, but felt like they were alone because the news was relatively sympathetic towards Vietnam War pro protesters' tactics. So it was basically people who the news, the people who reported the news or made the news, the producers were generally from backgrounds where they were sympathetic to protesters. A lot of people disliked the way that protesters went about their business. And Nixon actually appealed to 
that sentiment of a population that was against the Vietnam War at that time to then help extend the Vietnam War. So he successfully spoke to the silent majority and said, I need your support in the upcoming election and ended up basically saying he had a plan to get out of the Vietnam War and, and extending it. Uh, what we need to do is, is address that silent majority that doesn't feel represented by the current climate movement and reach them with ways of acting that they're actually, you know, down for doing um, that express themselves and have, be part of a movement that feels like it's for them, right? So uh, that feel like they can accept, accept anybody. So that's basically uh, what we're working on. Um, and I might say, okay, well, uh, how can we do that? Um, I'd say that there's a, there's a couple of things, uh, which is, you know, not sounding looking like everybody else. There's also what a lot of people, you know, the people who like are going to start this, which actually gives you credibility, is talking about things in a way that are a mess, but not saying, not explaining things to people. Like people know that they're a mess, that things are a mess, rather. People know this already. If you, instead of talking about how much they're a mess, you just think, yeah, look, people, we know this already. You know, many people know this already. And we need to do something together. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, showing this, the, the kinds of signs that you believe the public can handle truth, which is, you know, which is, is actually, I think, a reality. So the other thing that we're trying very hard to do is work against a long-standing scientific consensus or that basically negative messaging is something you should be wary of because we're going to depress people. Now, that is potentially true, right? It is potentially true. There have been psychological studies done where people are confronted with negative messaging, they get depressed, they don't act. However, you might say, well, can we create an environment for them to feel like they can take this news? Like, what would it be to create an environment where people are able to take negative news? Well, having it not facing the news alone, having a group to face it with, feeling as though you have a relevant action to take and feeling as though everybody else uh, is, or enough people are also ready to act at the same time. That's like, that's sort of basic organizational theory if you, how you motivate people. If you have an action that you feel like you can do and you feel like that action will help to a result that you actually care about eventually happen. In the case of big coordination, like problems like climate, other people have to be enrolled, right? So what you have to do is create that sense for people uh, of being part of that. So that's really our theory of change. And, and um, the way that we do that is kind of uh, multifold, but I think, so I've been speaking for like 20 minutes and I maybe, I can go on from there, but I might stop yeah. for questions now and we can, uh, you know, pick it up later on if, uh, if, if I can elaborate on some of these points, but I might like to just hear, you know, questions right now from people. Yeah, sure. We can definitely open it out. Does anyone have any, any questions um, for Liam or what he said so far? Go for Alex. Uh, yeah. Uh, so thanks, Liam. Uh, somehow all this, your your launch completely passed me by. I didn't realize all this was happening. It sounds amazing. Uh, really inspired to hear that. And also that the last point you made about the um, uh, the, the the impact of of hearing ne negative news and, and people feeling disempowered from it. I I need to take that on board for what I'm doing because other people have sort of mentioned that to me on my relevant education project. Um, but the specific question, as I, I'm not clear whether you're looking at a sort of top down or bottom up activism. I mean, what, you know, is it is it to persuade the people who've got the power to do the right things or persuade the people who don't have the power to to persuade the people who do have the power or, you know, What's what, what's the sort of logic behind the actors, activism both. you're after? So it, it would be both. I mean, I could maybe illustrate that with an example of workplace activism, right? So what the kind of action that goes on in the workplace right now is generally, okay, clouded by ideology where in business, you're supposed to be a cheerleader and, and basically, 
you have to believe that with enough innovation and hard work and dedication, clean products can chase dirty products from the marketplace uh, you know, without any laws being passed, right? It's total bullshit, right? It's, it's not true. Everybody in economics has known that it's not true and just any practical person has known that it's not true for a very long time. Uh, you know, markets do fail from economists. The average person knows that, well, yeah, you need a sustainable playing field, we like to call it. So there's two things of basically asking people in the government to do it, but also turning workforces into, into uh, pressure groups for their own workplace, right? Basically, let's turn your employer into a lobbyist for a sustainable playing field. Right. So there's both people on top, like Lord Deepen, you know, kind of breaking the ice and saying, look, we need some laws here. We need to get off of the idea that we're going to roll out technology at the pace we need without the government basically intervening heavily. That isn't going to happen. Uh, there's also workplaces advocating, uh, you know, people in workplaces advocating to their employers to join, in the, you know, to add their voice to that chorus of people calling for that type of action. Just for an example. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, that's that sounds really cool. Got that. Thanks. Anyone else? Anyone else have any other questions or thoughts they want to share? Alistair, go for it. Hi there. So I'm I'm quite new here, but hi everyone. I'm Alistair. I'm from Berlin. Really nice to 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 join you here. Um, Liam, it's super interesting. But I'm I'm just wondering in in terms of a kind of a, I guess what you could what you'd call a, a theory of change once you've got that kind of support and you I, th I think you alluded to it in your previous answer I mean there's a systemic level here and anybody engaged in any form of climate change recognizes that systemic level and I guess that's one of the most paralyzing things for most people because they feel overwhelmed by it yeah how assuming that you get to a point where you've mobilized millions and millions of people I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, you, you become a big force of, of some sort. What do you do with those people to actually if, activate some kind of systemic change? How, how do you, because that's effectively at a political level, how, how do you get to a point where you're, and, and what do you do with those people to get some kind of serious systemic and political changes? Yeah. Okay. So that's a great question. So basically one thing that I should explain, right? We don't see ourselves as particularly just like the climate majority project is not the climate majority. So part of the, the, the narrative and, the, and I think the reality is that look, as climate change gets worse and worse and more obvious and more undeniable, more people are going to wake up, right? If you just look at like studies of climate attitudes, uh, climate attitudes, climate concern go up as a function of weather events, more so than, you know, accumulating scientific facts. We all know that, like, basically, climate denial hovered in a very, you know, definite region for a very, you know, flat region for quite some time. Radical activism did some stuff in the UK recently, uh, but it's basically action, sort of activism and weather events, weather events drive it up. So part of what we're saying is that, look, there is going to be a climate movement. There is going to be a popular movement. What you need to do is catalyze it, right? So getting, spreading the, 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 the mentality that you're part of an inevitable historical wave, right? Like it isn't going to happen that, that people don't try and they just meekly accept oblivion. There is going to be uh, you know, a movement at some point when it's undeniable to people that's getting closer and closer. Uh, so let's move it forward. And part of how you do that move forward is if you're simply doing something visible. So if everybody does the most visible thing in the place they have the most power, which is for most people in their community or their workplace, um, that's probably the best way of changing attitudes, but also things that people do like community gardens and anything else, as long as we're identifying and strongly identifying what we're doing with systemic breakdown. I'm doing this because of systemic breakdown. This is my response to systemic breakdown. All those activities help to drive popular attitudes. So people basically um, have to send the message. We can send message with our behavior more effectively than we can use our voice, but we can do both, right? So really what we're, what we're looking to do is catalyze 
the onset of essentially what's a inevitable movement so that when this popular shift comes, it isn't too late, which is, you know, it's getting there already, but that's basically the point. So it's not, it's not really like a case of us, you know, getting this high, you know, this majority and then channeling people behind, you know, a single program of action that we thought of. What we're looking to do is kind of find leverage points where we can do something right now. Um, for example, just making the majority aware of itself. Like that's when we looked at the, the field, that's the most important thing. Like the majority of people don't feel like they're part of a majority. They don't think like a majority. The simple, you know, realization, oh, like a majority of people out there actually agree with my opinions. It's like simply, it's the easiest thing to do. That's what Nixon did. But basically everybody was ashamed of being upset with Vietnam war, war protesters and thought that they were, you know, they were alone until the silent majority speech. It's also a lot like what Occupy did, right? Like Occupy was basically an effort to let everybody who was screaming at their television after 2008 realize that, oh, uh, there's a lot of other people screaming at their televisions. Right, which is why it exploded overnight. Amazing, thanks, Liam. Is there anyone else that has any comments at this point or any questions? Um, yeah, I, I have a, a, a total boring practical question uh, for Liam. Um, if you talk about catalyzing these people or give them a feeling that they are part of a majority, how, how do you concretely plan to do that, that they maybe connect to each other or know about each other and uh, feel empowered because they know there are a lot of others that actually also try to do something about it. How, how do you intend to do that? Well, there isn't one way. I mean, the media campaign that I spoke about before is, is one already, right? People just don't know that. They haven't really like opened up the Express and seen Dale Vince on the front page on an editorial saying, you know, there's a climate concern majority out there. When Express is like a London tabloid or a UK tabloid paper, right? Like, so, uh, you know, they don't, they, that's news to a lot of people, uh, but there's also social media campaigns and there's any other activity that people take that gets attention and realize, oh, actually in putting forward the people who are not the usual suspects, right? That's the other thing that we can do, right? But for this campaign, it could be viral and, you know, people are already, kind of getting on social media and spreading that type of message right so i think it's a it's a it's a case of the majority waking itself up but there's there's not one way to do it it's basically pointing out how many people there are like you and people who have anybody who has a voice using it on social media and just right, continue thank to you. Use, you know you know create news items which you know we we are but okay um i have a question if people wanted to start having um a more transparent um or heartfelt conversation about this within their communities what is the way that you found is the kind of best way to open up um what can be quite a sensitive subject I mean, so there's a variety of those things. I'd say it de depends on the person's relationship with the community. I mean, climate cafes generally, I mean, there's all sorts of actually council level activities in the, in, in the UK uh, where people just getting together and sharing concerns because the reality is like, you don't actually have to tell people about stuff. You just create a space for people to talk about uh, their concerns and realize that their neighbors have the similar concerns. Uh, that is really, you know, effective, basically. And and also, though, another thing which is actually really good is adaptation. So one of the things that people are so like, we don't like talking about is just adaptation because it feels like defeatism. It's a huge mistake, I think, in the climate movement is like, yeah, just start talking about what we can do in a local level uh, to prepare for this uh, because it may be coming down the pipe or is coming down the pipe if we want to be really honest. So what can we do at a local level? Uh, and it's actually like the act of preparing it about that makes it more real. And if there's actual practical local stuff that people can be talking about, it's more motivating, more interesting for people. 
Uh, and what we need to do is make the issue real and not to kind of shame people for worrying about their kind of private petty concerns more than the concerns of people halfway across the world because it's just like people are like that. You know, this is another issue that we have in the climate movement is that people are supposed to care enormously about what happens in Bangladesh. And, you know, when you have focus groups, well, I just talk to people, they're kind of like, well, you know, I just, I don't want to say this, but I don't really, you know, it's not my major concern. And, you know, this is part of, they don't want to engage in a climate conversation because they feel that they're going to be shamed for basically being mainly concerned about their family and their neighbors and the health of their community. Uh, but yeah, I think when as soon as people really start engaging this year, they start realizing more and more that their welfare can't really be separated from those people in Bangladesh. And they're a lot more likely to start caring. Wonderful, thank you. Does anyone else have any other thoughts or comments? Or... Yeah, I'd like to add, I mean, also to your question, Lauren, coming from a background of kind of animal rights activism, and you know, I've spent years kind of, I've stood on the street showing people slaughter videos and that doesn't always work. Sometimes it works for people, but the, the ways that I found to be effective is kind of like um, fact-based humor. Um, you may see people like Russell Brand. I mean, you can debate whether it's factual all of the time, but the majority of it is. And the way that he shows up and presents himself is something that people can connect to really well. Um, and the other one is kind of like narrative driven um yeah i guess i guess like you know if you can hook someone into an idea of what the future might be so you could be like oh can you imagine if we live in this apocalypse scenario like oh what would you do and you bring people into that story and you're like oh well you know that's coming like this is the experience that we're going to have and it opens up for a conversation about like oh shit like what are we going to do now you know um so yeah i wanted to add those and then also like Liam, you mentioned about kind of metamodernism and how that come, kind of comes into CMP. I was curious to hear more about that. Okay, yeah. I mean, just another one, good conversational method. On the, since we're talking about that, everything that matters to you. If you ask people what matters to them, you can relate pretty much anything to climate. So if you get good at it, you basically ask them what matters and then say, well, you know, actually that'll be, you know, affected in this and this way, right? So... You just do it with your friends and then, you know, do it with your neighbors afterwards after you've gotten the hang of it. Uh, you know, that's another one that people like to to, to use. Um, so metamodernism. Um, well, I mean, the basic thing is, you know, a lot of metamodernism has, a, has one of the main strands of metamodernism is transcending and including progressive ideas, right? Uh, and so... So, I mean, people, some people are probably are familiar with my past work on uh, progressive ideology and say like specifically what I call the equality complex, um, right? Um, you know, that's basically the concentration of it in the climate movement, first of all, is enormous, uh, you know, in progressive spaces. So people feel um, and by this, I mean, essentially, the idea that I have to care about everybody equally, we all are, you know, everybody's equal in some abstract sense, and that we have to write all inequalities between people. And if you basically don't agree with that completely, or you don't disagree violently with any idea that doesn't sound like it's an opposition uh, with any idea, if you don't violently disagree with something that violates that, like an imperfect uh, conclusion about global justice, like we're probably the rich countries have a uh, superior bargaining position and we may not have an economy, a global economy where everybody has equal incomes in 50 years. We might want to just accept that that's probably going to be the case. And at the same time, advocate for the best, most equal outcome that we could possibly get within the political situation, right? That would be a, a normal pragmatist answer. Like, you know, I can have an ideal of getting to that, but also realize that I probably am not going to meet that ideal, right? I mean, that's an example of something that a progressive mindset doesn't particularly, uh, doesn't particularly admit, right? And the, the metamodern idea of like, yeah, I can have those ideas and realize that actually 
standing for the kind of equal uh, welfare of all human beings is a, is a, is a, is a you know, great idea. At the same time, it's it's just an, a view, uh, and there's a lot that can potentially go wrong if we make a dogma out of it, right? And I think really core to what we do in life itself and metamodernism is to take every view and hold it at you know at a remove at, at a be able to switch between views to realize that okay tribalism what we call tribalism is kind of maybe not a bad thing necessarily humans i would say like humans are a super organism you know every human society is a super organism it's basically like an organism made of little cells and tribalism is the glue that holds together the cells of a particular super organism, right? Like families have to stick together somehow. The reason, the way they stick together, you know, biologically could be argued to be the feeling of tribal impulses, what we call tribal impulses, right? And that is flies in the face of the idea that we all should care about every person equally, right? Uh, and right, and so it's like, it's worth, it's, noticing those types of ideologies and saying okay and working with them you know practicing the art so to be use a kind of something that better modernists might like practicing the art of the pragmatic sublime uh where we realize that the world is imperfect and take uh you know every the best steps we can take through this thorny imperfect territory uh rather than holding up for the perfect frictionless path uh you know is really uh, I, th I think something the climate movement could benefit from. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Sorry for Alex. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you got onto the metamodernism bit, Liam. I've, uh, for various reasons, I've, I've gone back and reading bits more of, of Hans's book. Uh, it's always, there's always new stuff in there. Um, and one of the things that uh, it's sort of obvious that, that there's a section in there that I reread, which is his section, which says development matters. Like, you know, the whole way of looking at the world is based on the understanding of, of, of development. So um, two questions. One is, is there anything in the structure of the approach uh, of what you're doing that takes into account the different developmental levels or the activities or the messaging that, that would be appropriate for the different developmental levels? One question, a sort of follow-up, so not quite related, but a little bit. Um, climate is one of a range of things that can go wrong. Um, and in a sense, the bigger question is, why the hell haven't we been able to fix climate? You know, we've known about it for a long time. Um, and we've got all the UN sustainability development goals, millennial goals, and we just couldn't get our act together to fix any of those. So, I mean, it may be beyond the scope of what you're doing, but you know, it's sort of integrated. Is there anything in, in looking at the, the bigger picture of why we haven't been able to fix it so far that it goes into, informing how what you're doing now that might might be different in some way okay so i'll answer the second one first um yes absolutely uh so you know i would i'd call us a, a, a poly crisis aware climate organization okay uh, generally people are poly crisis aware and uh, you know many of the your radical or advanced climate, if you talk to sustainability people, right? Generally, most people realize that we're in a, the crisis is a lot more than climate. However, for exactly the reason that you said, it's kind of climate turns out to be this point that for the kind of privileged members of society, and you know, I use that word advisedly, you know, like for a lot of people, that's the kind of proof point that the system's broken. You know, and especially the most influential people, you know, people who lived in, you know, neighborhoods or situations that already seem pretty broken. Uh, it may not have taken climate, but as far as convincing the kind of, you know, the most powerful sectors of society that have enough influence to maybe make a difference that the system is broken enough that their future is at stake, climate is probably 
that issue, or at least it's, it's more likely to be that issue than anything else that I can see, right? So yes. this is part of the reason of engaging with it kind of responsibly is, that, is let's not pretend it's not deeply interwoven with deep flaws in the system. It absolutely is. It's, you know, a first fatal symptom or syndrome to emerge from a deeply flawed way of being. And I think people increasingly recognize that, right? So, I mean, if you want to then prove that in arguments or whatever, you know, people are a little bit skeptical, you know, our usual next thing is biodiversity. Uh, if you think about biodiversity, you can imagine easy kind of fixes to climate, we kind of, you know, roll out the green technology, we put in the carbon tax, but biodiversity is just as far along. Uh, it's a lot easier, or harder to think of an easy solution to biodiversity. So if you just you know, the web of life is an easier way of talking about it. The health of the web of life is greatly impaired. Uh, this is what biodiversity experts or biologists across the world think. It's more of, you know, as far along the crisis as, as climate is. So um, it's using the climate crisis as a way of, of getting to the depth of change that we need, which is important, right? So, and I think as soon as you start thinking about it, it well, why has our activism failed? Well, you know, it's, it's like the stories that I spoke about before, market fundamentalism, or what Thomas Bjorkman and other metamodernists would call the market myth, right, is a huge part of the failure of climate action, right, is that we don't see industries lobbying for better rules. We see industries pretending that just, that somehow somebody's going to prevent, uh, invent a product to fix this all, right? Elon Musk is going to fix it. So, you know, he basically allows the kind of current paradigm to keep on believing in itself, which is why he's become such a hero, right? But it, it's it's not it's not true, right? If you look at you know, for example, heating of you know most products need to be heated. Uh, you know, I'm sorry if you know you've heard this before, but most things, basically industrial processes, require heating. Uh, doing that without fossil fuels is really really hard. So and really really expensive. We're nowhere near the technology required to allow people to produce many, many industrial products, like just those involving metal, concrete, and et cetera, without fossil fuels in a way that's remotely competitive uh, with fossil fueled heating, right? And that's just an example, like that's the whole manufacturing industry where we're just nowhere near a, a you know, market victorious green technology. And you can just go down the line, there's reports from system IQ or systemic, uh, in the UK, which kind of go into gross detail about this stuff. But, um, you know, that's the reality. And, and more and more, I think business people are getting desperate to just say it out loud. And, you know, part of what we're doing is recruiting the ones who are willing to do that to say it together. Good, thanks. Wonderful, thank you. So we, we have about 13 minutes left. So I'm going to ask you, Liam, if you're okay to give us a summary of the top three takeaways that you would like us and the viewers who maybe watch this later to be able to take away and share um, as part of the conversation. What would they be? Um, there is a climate majority. It's only going to grow deeper. Um, it does need to be deep in. So it's not, I'm not saying that, hey, we're ready for system change tomorrow. I'm saying that a majority of people realize there's an issue and they're, they don't trust the institutions that, that are out there. Uh, they need a credible voice. So that's part of what CMP is doing. So we need to create credible voices. That means having voices that are not, don't sound ideologically blinkered. It sounds like uh, you know, they're for people like them. Uh, and, you know, Finally, you should, you know, give us an email uh, and, 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 you know, and join, see what you can do or, or be part of something we're organizing. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Does anyone else have any other final thoughts or comments that they want to share or even Liam? Could I ask, do, do you, Liam, do you have any, um, if we were going to read something uh, about this. Do you have anything you've done? Uh, do you have anything that you're reading right now that you would point us in the direction of? Well, we have a theory of change document, which is like essentially outlines these, these four pillars in brief. 
Um, and then there's a book actually. It's a we have a book that's going to come out in the fall, which has like contributions from the initiatives we're supporting as well, uh, and kind of longer treatments of the various kind of what we call the four strands, which are um, telling the truth, the truthful narrative shifts, inner work, uh, practical action, and sense making. So you know, telling people the truth, helping them, you know, not facing it alone, having something to do about it having a, a kind of coherence to those actions such that it feels like this is worth doing right uh so we kind of outline those and how to build them in the theory of change and then there's that's going to be explored more deeply in the book that's coming out in the fall which is uh basically going to be submitted to the publisher in four days so thank you Awesome. Go on, Nathan. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just gonna thank Liam again for for coming in, and uh, yeah, hope hope you'll bring some of the climate action to the hub as well. I know you've got a residency coming up with Mark, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do you want to sh share a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so uh, the, the the interbeing one is a continuation of um, what we've done in the past uh, on interbeing. So interbeing is, is, is the awareness that all of us are, not all, only all of us, but everything is interconnected. Nothing has a self nature. Um, that's uh, so, you know, partially that comes from a Buddhist background. It's, I am a kind of Thich Nhat Hanh person and in my past and in the present as well. Uh, and so, that is going to be one week of exploration of what how science and contemplation can learn from each other or go a level deeper so you all know that there's ongoing uh collaboration there but um it can be deepened quite a lot uh and we're going to talk as well about i mean maybe for this audience as well uh people might look at this video that indeed a neuroscience which is inspired by uh, contemplative priorities may very well help to convince us that simpler lives uh, that are that can be lived within ecological boundaries are a step forward, not a, a, a kind of a failure of of, of you know, civilization, but just what we should be doing anyways. Right? There's this sort of beautiful coincidence that uh, we would. Improve, you know, basically the, the best route to improving welfare would probably uh, be quite sustainable in the next 20 years if we could just manage to convince ourselves to do it. Yeah, awesome. I assume you are talking about the contemplative citizen science on the 9th yeah. of September, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's, yeah. That, that, will, that, that group will, will go forward into interbeing as well, right? Mm, so, mm. There's one week on contemplative citizen science and then two weeks on interbeing and those those two uh residencies have a, a kind of a, a connection of feeding off of each other amazing i'm also hoping to uh come to the hub during that time so i look forward to meeting you then Great. fingers crossed i don't know yet but i hope to <laughs> lovely we're waiting for you nathan <laughs> looking forward all right does anyone else have anything to share before we close no amazing well thank you all for coming and thank you Liam for sharing and uh yeah this recording will be up probably by next week uh on YouTube and on our website and uh yeah so you can watch back and and share it with anyone if you feel inspired Great. Yeah, and then, I'd be happy to answer questions as well if people, you know, send them on email. Amazing. And then our next call will be on the 10th of August for anyone else that wants to join us. And we'll send more details about that as well soon. Yeah, we're not sure on the topic yet, right? But it's the... Yeah, it's still, still officially kind of like undecided. We're just waiting to get the information. Um, but it will be kind of around life visioning or kind of like helping organizations or individuals kind of really work on organizing themselves around those like truer principles 
kind of general topic, but yeah, we'll just still it down a bit more once we got all the info. All right. Well, thanks everyone and hopefully see you soon. Ciao.